the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. In faith and in God's fear, let us come before God's throne of grace, confessing our sins and trusting in His forgiveness and restoration. Most merciful God, Only in Christ Jesus are we made complete, complete as God's creation, and completely cleansed of our guilt and sin. Upon this year confession, I, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Merciful Father, your patience and loving kindness toward us have no end. Grant that by your Holy Spirit, we may always think and do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. 
Uh, they're going to test me today. Holy moly. Huh? Um, Old Testament reading is Genesis 2, verses 18 to 25. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God has formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He gave them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. The epistle today is Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 18. We must pay more attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers. And in the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I, and the children of God have given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he was able to help those who are being tempted. This is the word of the Lord. All you children, come forward, please. Good morning, good morning. 
So today, I'm going to start with a little bit of the gospel reading. In a little bit, we're going to hear this part. It says, People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant, and he said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. That's a perfect children's message right there. You know what? What does that make you guys think of when you hear that part about Jesus welcoming the children Does it make you feel special? It should. And that part where he says, truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God is like a little child. Who does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. That part isn't really for you guys. That part is for all of us, the children of God who aren't children necessarily anymore. So Jesus wants his followers to be like children. So for you guys, that's easy right now. But you're going to grow up someday, and you're not going to be so young anymore. And so I was thinking, I was thinking about these four things that children naturally have and do that you should keep when you're a child of God, even though you're a little bit older. Can I tell you what they are? The first one is all your energy. Now, you guys have tons of natural energy, and if we could just bottle that and keep that, how awesome that would be. But really, I think what Jesus means is children have this natural energy, and we should never lose that excitement, that zeal for God. Okay? So try to hang on to a little bit of your energy. You're going to wish you had more of it later. And the second thing is your innocence. We are supposed to be innocent like doves. We are supposed to think on things that are good and lovely and pure. When we fill up with those good things, when we fill our minds with them, then our hearts are full of them too. So as you get older, you don't have to lose your innocence. Okay? And the the third thing is your sense of humility. Children know that you aren't strong enough or smart enough or big enough to do things on your own. So much of your life, you have to have help to do things. And I think the problem when you get older is that you start to think you can do things on your own. But we still will always never be big enough, never be smart enough, never be strong enough to do things without Jesus. Can you remember that? And then the last thing is acceptance of love. A child does not think about earning or deserving or paying back love. They just accept and usually expect to be loved. And that kind of acceptance and openness to love is so precious to God. So those are the things I want you to think about as you get older, your energy, keeping your mind full of good things, being humble, knowing that you need help, and accepting being open to God's love. If we all came to Jesus with those things, how happy he would be. You guys pray with me. Father God, we are your children, all of us. Help us to come to you with open hearts. Help us to be full of vigor for you. Help us to be innocent, humble, and expecting to be loved well by you. In the name of Jesus, amen. So today, I have not something you can eat, but I have a little bookmark for you to take home, and it has this Bible verse on it. So I thought that would be pretty cool for you guys to remember. Jesus is your friend, and he calls you to him. He wants to bless you. Okay, come get one of those. Open. 
Benjamin. You do, Benjamin? Awesome. Liza. Thanks, guys. All right. Please rise for the gospel reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? He replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because of your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man, let man not separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if, she, if, and if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his, arm, in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Please be seated and let's sing the hymn.
Good morning. It's good to be here with you this morning to uh, worship and receive God's blessings that comes through our, uh, the Word of God in the sacrament. And uh, I pray that your love and your heart for God would be enriched through this time together. Do you know the similarities in between a police officer and your significant other like spouse? I didn't think you'd know, so I came up with the answers. The similarity is this, both of them have law. So the police officer will say, do not go above the speed limit. You can maybe do five miles above 70s, but you cannot go 10 or 15, right? And so it is with your significant other. Like for my wife's case, you say, if you're the last one getting out of your bed, you should make the bed. (laughs) Yeah, I had to learn that for many years. I failed for five years of my marriage. Both of them have laws. What's the difference? The difference is this. Police officer doesn't care about your heart. All he cares is actually you deliver the compliance to the rule. You got to keep the rule. Whether you're sorry for it, you're mistaken about it, doesn't care. All he cares is about your performance of keeping the rule. However, your significant other, like your husband or wife or boyfriend, girlfriend, They actually care about your heart. And sometimes it doesn't matter whether whether you keep the rules well. It's all about the heart. And when they can see that your performance is not rooted in heart, they will not take it. Have you ever been there? Yeah. Because they care about heart. Some people think God is like an officer. It's all the punch list of rules that you got to keep it. You can't keep it, that's why you go to hell, and it goes on. However, the Bible tells us that God is not like a police officer. He is more like a significant other, and he wants to be the significant other, and out of that relationship, he wants you to have also a heart-filled relationship with your significant others in your family or marriage and church. God cares about heart. He's not like a police officer. He's more like your significant other. If you understood that, you can check out for the next 25 minutes. We have a text here, and um, it's a it's a difficult topic. It's about divorce, isn't it? So I, you know, um, and what we, um, but it's. The text is about divorce, but it's actually all about heart. It's about the heart that God wants from us as human beings, and also it's the heart that God wants in his institution that he created called marriage with a husband and wife. And we learn this from Jesus' conversation. The reason why Jesus says Moses permitted divorce was because of their heart, and it's not the original intent, as Moses also Uh, wrote Genesis where the two shall become one. He says God's original intention was to be together and faithful. Husbands were supposed to love and care for their wives and not abandon them. In other words, they should have a loving heart for their wife, a good heart like God's heart toward us. But that was not the case with men in Israel in general. There's always exceptions. There is the minorities who are faithful. But in general, Israel men's heart was hard. They got called toward their wife, and sometimes they didn't want to be faithful. And this is the reason why God gave them permission, though it's not the plan A. That's like a plan D. God wanted to preserve, scholars say, the reason why Moses allowed it is because God wanted to preserve and protect the girl who was married to this guy, and he was not taking care of her or love her. It would be miserable for her to remain in this relationship without being loved and cared for and provided for, especially in that time where economy was all driven by males. So it was a plan to protect the girl who's not being loved and cared for, who's toward whom her husband's heart became very cold. But that's not how it's supposed to be. Husband's heart should reflect God's heart and should be loving and caring for their wives. Of course, vice versa. But because men were hardened against their wives, 
That's why Moses allowed this plan D. God wanted always a soft heart from his marriage. He created man and woman to be together, husband and wife, and they were supposed to have loving heart toward each other, especially from husband who is responsible for the union. And this is why God allowed it. That's why Jesus says it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. Jesus replied. In other words, as somebody brilliantly said, it's about the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Of course, this heart problem of the husbands in God's nation, Israel, was rooted in their heart problem in their relationship with God, which is often portrayed with marital relationship. When you think about husband and wife, you should always think about God and humanity. God always identifies himself as the husband, and we, us human beings, and particularly Israel people, are called wife. Israel was like the wife of God, the husband. But in their marital relationship with God, guess what the Israel did? Just like a cold-hearted husband, their heart was cold toward God, their spouse. And their heart became cold and stiff and hardened. And so their heart, they had their heart turned cold toward God, their husband. God actually described this many times, and he will say stuff like, I want you to circumcise your heart. Like, I want you to, you know, open up your heart. I want to cut your heart. But it comes out strikingly in the words of Jeremiah. Just listen to some of these things that God wanted Jeremiah to deliver to Israel as a nation. Here's what God says. I remember how eager you were to please me as a young bride long ago. God is speaking to Israel. Who's the bride here? Israel. It's a marriage relationship. How you loved me and followed me. He's thinking about like the first time, like husband and wife in their honeymoon stage years. Even through the barren wilderness. What do you think the wilderness is? It's the 40 years of journey. In those days, Israel was holy to the Lord. Holy means you're set apart. It was like his wife. Okay, husbands, you are holy to your wife because why? Husbands, you are selected out of the, all the men to be one with your wife. And wives, you're holy to your husband because you're set apart from all the other ladies and became union with you. That's how Israel was to God. You are like, but, that's how it was. But, you are like a wild donkey sniffing the wind at mating time. Who can restrain her lust? Those who desire her don't need to search, for she goes running to them. When will you stop running? When will you stop panting after other gods? They were committing idolatry against God. God said, that's like cheating. You're cheating. You're like, you, you loved me, cared for me, but now you're lustful. And your heart has basically grown to, you know, cold toward me. Why? Because they've forgotten their husband. Verse 32 of Jeremiah 2 says, Does a young woman forget her jewelry or a bride? Forget her wedding dress? No, they don't. Yet, for years on end, my people have forgotten me. They've forgotten their God who saved them out of Egypt, and their heart got hardened, and they went for other gods. Like a husband went for other women, or a wife who went for other men. What was the problem of all that? The heart. It's not about, for God, it's not about performance and keeping the rules. It's about, like, heart. It's about heart. And as much as they were not faithful to God, it resulted in many kinds of other problems, including their marriage. Husbands, their heart, uh, they would just go run after other women and they will divorce uh, their wives. Of course, this heart problem continued to the time of God when God decided to send his son Jesus to return to Israel with his presence. God the husband returned to Israel by sending Jesus. This is why Jesus talks his arrival like a wedding and a husband, bridegroom and the bride. Remember those 
uh, various stories in the gospel, if you read them, you'll see like the first miracle that Jesus did. It was winemaking for the wedding wine at a wedding party. The whole point of that, there are many points, but one of the major points is that there is now, it's time for wedding. Why? Because God the husband has come in his presence through his son Jesus Christ. Wonderful. Mysterious. You remember Jesus talking about the kingdom of heaven is like the ten bridesmaids we're waiting for, right? And they missed the bridegroom when he came. Right? He's talking about him coming, God, the husband, and then the, some people are not ready and they're missing it. Once again, it's a wedding stuff, marriage stuff. And that's, this is why it's not surprising to see St. Paul paralleling, uh, uh, making a parallelism of husband and wife with Jesus, uh, husband and wife and with Jesus and God's people. Right? He's, have you ever heard this? Husbands, you, are, you should love your wife as Christ loved the church. Wives, as the Christ is the head of the church, your husband is the head of, your, head of you. Some of your favorite passages, right? <laughs> Why? Because here once again, God, the husband of humanity, who set apart Israel, has come and returned to his bride in and through the person of Jesus Christ. But guess what? Once again, the things that they do in their own marriage and what their forefathers has done in their history They do the same thing again. They reject Jesus, the husband. The question about, you know, divorce here is not about divorce. Actually, they are trying to trap Jesus. They're not asking, what about, what what do you believe about marriage and divorce? The reason why they're asking this question is because they want to get Jesus in trouble, because they're rejecting Jesus and their, their heart is cold and hardened toward God and Jesus. This hint is given to us in Mark verse 1 of the chapter that we read. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan, it says. Mark tells us because that's important. That's the place. It's like you look at the map. You go down from Galilee, and this is Judea, and this is Galilee. You are across from the Judea on the other side, and that area is called Perea. And Perea is a place where Herod Antipas was the governor. What did Herod Antipas did a few years ago? Or, yeah, a few years ago, maybe a few months ago, not too long ago. He divorced his, his own wife so that he can marry his brother's wife. And who called that out? John the baptizer said, you can't do that. If you're a king of Israel, you can't do that. That's not right as a king of God's nation. And then what did John, uh, what did Herod and Tippas do? He put him in the prison and then cut his head off. This is where Jesus has come. Now the Pharisees are pretty smart people. They're asking Jesus, what do you think about divorce? <laughs> he needs to be very careful how he tame his tongue here. If he says yes, you cannot divorce. And what's going to happen? He's going to be thrown in prison. He will get his head cut off. If he says, it's okay, you can, you can divorce so that he can save his life, what's going to happen? Then he's going to be like, oh, you're not, you're not like John the baptizer. And all the people who were following Jesus were hinted by and kind of foreran by John the baptizer. He's going to lose the traction of his ministry. That's what's going on. It's not about divorce. It's about them rejecting God and Jesus, the sent one from God, and they're trying to get him in trouble. You see what I'm saying? It's about their heart against God and Jesus. And it's amazing how Jesus navigates these traps. I would be sweating. I'd be like, "Uh, no comment. I will run. (laughs) Come back next Sunday. What the point, what's the point? Once again, it's about the heart. It shows the heart of the hardened heart of Pharisees and the leadership and the people in general in Israel. People rejected God, their husband. They rejected God sent one Messiah, Jesus, and they rejected their wife when they should have loved and been faithful to all those relationships. Why? Because of their stiff, hardened heart which matters to God very much. So here's my question for you. Here's some applications. 
one question and then application. How is your heart? My dear brothers and sisters in Grace Lutheran Church, how is your heart? As we gather together here to show our love to God and receive his love through his word and forgiveness and the sacraments, how is your heart? Do you love him? When you stand out of reverence to God, do you honor him with your heart? When you confess your sins, do you actually confess your sins that you have um, offended him from your heart? How is your heart? I'm not saying your heart is bad. I'm just asking the question, okay? And if you feel like, oh, my heart is not in the right place, then today is the day God wants to visit to your heart, and I want you to open your heart and cut your heart open. And you need to work on your heart, like a heart surgery. Here are a few things you can do to have heart surgery on you, to work on your heart. You may have different ideas, but here are some examples, okay? First, you should remember God's heart for you. Do you know who God is for you? He is the one who created you. It's not your parents who created you. They were very involved, very involved, but they never had the final say to have you, right? We are never created by our parents. Through our parents, God created you. So the reason why you are here and breathing this nice, wonderful air last couple days is because of God. All the gifts and the talents and passions and everything that you have is from God. The whole nature that we enjoy, though it's very severely broken because of all of our sin and all the curses that came with it, and the result and the consequences of our, our relationship broken from God. However, it's beautiful. I love the Morro Bay. I'm sure you do as well. I love the mountain. I wanted to go camping, but I'm waiting. <laughs> it's beautiful, isn't it? All of that, did you create that? No, it's all from God. And everyone that you love and care, your grandkids, your precious children, you know you didn't create them. They are gifts from God. Everything you wear, it's from God. I didn't, I didn't make them, right? The music, it's from God. God loves you and created you, and he enjoys you. He delights in you, and he created you, not so that you can be like a robot and work hard like a robot. He wanted you so that he can have relationship with you. Isn't that all we want, to be known and to know? Bottom line? Isn't that the biggest thing in our life? And that's the reason why God created you. That's his heart. But you see his heart most amazingly through the Son, Jesus Christ. Look at Jesus is here, what he's doing. He is navigating through this very difficult journey. He's headed toward Jerusalem, and he's got uh, mines all over the place by Pharisees and other people. He's having a rough, rough time navigating. He's got to really be careful with what he says. Why did he put up with all that? Why did he take this enormous pressure on him? Because he loves you, and he wanted to reconcile you to God in spite of our sins. And he will continue to this, this journey, and he will go to the cross, and he will be beat up, he will bleed, he will be tortured, he will be humiliated, he will be naked, and then he will be hung on the cross. And he will give his life, his blood, his body for you, so that your price of your sins can be paid for, so that you can receive cleansing through his blood, and so that you can be made holy like a brand new bride by taking his body on the cross. So that you can be reconciled. We're like whores, and through Jesus, we are washed like a bride, new bride, and created new so that we can be in perfect harmony and relationship with God. That's who we are receiving in the later part of our service. That's why Jesus was navigating through all these minds. 
That's why Jesus will go on the cross. Do you see his heart for you? When you remember that, that's how you can open your heart. I actually came up with like six more, but I have no idea how far I am in right now. So I'm going to wrap it up right there. If you need more of that, just see me and I'll send you the rest of it. Okay. God is more like our significant other, more like our spouse. He cares about our hearts. He cares our hearts uh, to our loved ones in our marriage. He cares about our hearts toward our parents, our children, and our grandchildren, grandparents, and our families. The heart of the matter is heart. So friends, I want you to work on your heart toward God, work on your heart toward one another, and work on your heart toward one another at Grace Lutheran Church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we um, come to you and we give you our hearts. We ask you that you would, by your Holy Spirit, open our hearts and make our hearts softened, if should there be any hearts that are hardened. Help us to remember all the things you've done for us and how much you loved us, so that our heart would be filled with your love, which will overflow in our marriage, in our family, and in our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So with that, I invite you to, um, we sing. Thanksgiving to God for his mercies shown to us in Jesus Christ and for the opportunities for, his, for service in his kingdom through the Lutheran Women's Missionary League. Let us speak together the LWML Pledge. In fervent gratitude. continue with the prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for gathering us this morning. Father, we ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit upon all of us here at Grace and all Christians around the world who are gathered to worship you and receive your word and sacrament this morning. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all you have done, including navigating through various traps and dangers laid before you. You face them and you didn't shy away from them for all, all of that for us. We praise you and thank you. Lord, in your mercy. 
Holy Spirit, stir our hearts for God and help us to remember all He has done for us. Work in us so that our hearts are soft toward God and our family and fellow members of grace. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we also give you thanks for LWML, and we ask that you continue to be with them and lead them, and we look forward to see wonderful things that you will do through them. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for those who are in pain and need of your presence and healing. Remember Sandy, Rishers, Hornsey, Jeremy Knipe, Arcadio Gomez and family, Suzanne Peckard and Joyce Anderson in our shut-ins. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we ask you to give us rain and put out fires. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we pray all this through, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the announcement. Okay, please remember to fill out your pink attendance forms. Uh, there is a Growing in Grace preschool coupon book fundraiser. You can help raise money for the preschool while supporting local businesses. Inside are coupons for Quesadilla Gorilla, Orange Works, Chapala Grill, Nothing Bunt Cakes, Valhalla Restaurant and Gift Shop, Rookie Sports, Bar and Grill, Visalia Adventure Park, and many more. Want to buy one for yourself or for someone you know? They will be available in the church office for $20. Sale ends Friday, October the 8th, 2021. Please see the connection email for information about the following events. LWML October meeting on Tuesday, October the 12th. Trunk or treat on Saturday, October 30th annual LWML Boutique on Saturday, November the 6th.
Please rise. On the night our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he gave to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave to his, to his disciples, saying, Take and drink, this is my blood of new covenant shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. We continue with Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Out of your reverence for God, please rise. Let's pray. Grant, O Lord, that we, what we have received with our lips, we keep with pure hearts. And that through the gift imparted to us in this present life, we may hereafter receive life everlasting. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Receive the blessings from our Heavenly Father. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor 
and give you peace. Amen. Amen.